Hello, and welcome to Makers.dev episode number 14. Chris, hello. How are you? Hello. I'm doing okay this week. I would say not only great, okay. but okay. Yeah. Why only okay? Uh, I think my wife and I both don't feel great. It's not COVID. It is something stomach-related, but that's all right. I'll live. I hate stomach-related things more than anything else because a cold I can sort of deal with of I'll just blow my nose more often. But if it's stomach related, I feel like that hijacks my emotions in this really strange way of like, I just feel like everything is worse. And anything I think about, I, I have a sinking feeling in my stomach because of course my stomach feels bad. <laughs> and then I try to rationalize like, oh, there's something deeply emotionally wrong with this thing. But no, I just I just feel nauseous. Uh, so I, I sympathize with you. Uh, I feel a little sleepy today. I think I might take a nap after this episode. Uh, I'd love to talk about the podcast last week. That was the first week that I ran this podcast through my full media production engine on Clips Marketing and extracted a couple of clips and fantastic feedback. It looks like it went super well. There, there was one uh, clip that got picked up by this dude that I hadn't heard of before that I think you had that had like 40,000 followers or something. Uh, I should have written his name down, but I <laughs> uh, don't remember his name. But uh, that, that format and uh, also... I feel like I've had more interactions with people now of things that they've been engaged with in the podcast. Uh, so that feels really cool. It feels like the, the engine is working and I like it a lot. Yeah. Yeah. It's neat. Just like we said, you know, it's cool that we can have these conversations and then other people can share in here and then we can talk about it afterwards too. Um, yeah, it's, it's just neat. <laughs> I'd always heard the adage that you should spend like, uh, eight times more time on marketing than you spend on actually recording the content, uh, which I don't think I agree with from a time perspective, but I could, I could see that from like an energy or an output perspective that we go through all this work to be doing work in our lives and then having this conversation. And the easy thing to do would be, okay, we'll just slide it into the next episode of a podcast app and only people that are able to see podcasts are able to, to access that. Uh, but for just a little bit more work, I can take that content and repurpose it of like, okay, it's, it's video instead. How much more effort does that take? We both have to set up cameras and then, okay, it's not just one long form video. It's a bunch of tiny clips instead. And then once I have those clips, well, it's just a little bit more marginal effort to queue those clips up so that they post once per day. And, uh, that gets automatically queued. And then I could imagine, uh, I don't know that the audience for this podcast would be on like, <laughs> TikTok or like uh, Instagram <laughs> right. or something, but for, for a little bit more marginal effort, we could also be syndicating on those platforms. And uh, I don't know, maybe the next thing we do is like an email newsletter where each clip gets emailed out once per day. I'm, I'm starting to see and embody the idea that promotion is a very important part of the, of the media production. And I'm seeing results from it of like <laughs> episodes that we probably like, we're not talking about anything particularly more interesting in episodes where I clip versus episodes that I don't, but there's so much more interaction, so much more engagement and uh, hopefully so much more like benefit from people listening to us chat about stuff uh, when I go through that extra marginal effort. So I like it. It's uh, it feels good. It feels like we're doing the right thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, speaking of which, do you want to talk about your clipping? Uh, you last week you talked about how you were not sure what to do with clipping uh, and then you listened to the run with it podcast where they talked about clipping uh yes you want to talk about that what did you learn absolutely first of all fantastic recommendation my gosh that was just perfect that, that was exactly the conversation and advice that i wanted to hear that was uh making the most of social media with whitney hansen on the run with it podcast and she runs uh, a sort of adjacent company. Uh, I'm actually not clear on what she does, but it, it's not in clipping or media production. I think she has like a, a podcast and a personal brand and uh, sort of business advice stuff. And so she had this idea that like this concept of having clips out in the world is so beneficial. If you just went to people who have a medium sized following and said, Hey, I'll pick up this part of your business for you for uh, her pricing was $500 for clipping two 50 minute pieces of content, I think per month, she said, 
uh, which is lower than I was thinking if I was going to do this as an agency, but I think that price point would make sense for the type of audience she's describing. Uh, and they went through a whole bunch of different benefits of that, of like, uh, maybe if it's a person that you're trying to get in contact with, you offer to do this for free, and now you, you've developed a relationship with this person, and even just being in proximity with this type of person can benefit you. Uh, some things they said also that I loved were, that were angles on this problem that I hadn't considered, that business owners don't always know what resonates the most with their audience. So right now I'm doing the clipping for this episode and it's got me curious, how might I set up a system where I was not the person clipping it? Uh, either I was hiring someone else to do it or uh, an element of this that I'm thinking is what if it was more crowdsourced? I'll get into that. <laughs> uh, other things she said was the shotgun approach is much more effective if you're just pushing more content out there that is going to work better than if you try to make one perfectly piece of crafted content, which of course it's like the parable of the, the pottery, uh, the, the group in the class who's just trying to make the most pottery is going to make better pots than the group that's trying to make the, the best pot. Uh, what else? The, she, she paints a really good picture of like who the person is who would benefit the most from this. People who are streaky, people who uh, have published some of this stuff in the past but aren't consistent, uh, who like recognize the value of it, but uh, just, just need someone to help them be consistently uh, posting it. And then even like the type of Facebook ad to, to make of look for people who are following Gary Vee and Mel Robbins and Jasmine Starr. Uh, and pre-sell it before you build the product, which we talked about in the last episode, <laughs> maybe not the best strategy for us, uh, if it's like so cheap for us to, to make the thing before we uh, have built it. So here's sort of where I feel like I'm coming to on this. I don't think I wanna be running a consulting company. The thing that I love about File Inbox is that I have so much autonomy and freedom to be doing things that are not running file inbox. And that gives me the flexibility to do things like, ah, uh, clip stop marketing. That's a thing I wanna spend all of my time on <laughs> and just ignore customer support emails for uh, a little while, like right. a month. Uh, and like, that's okay, the business doesn't fall apart. And I could see getting to that point running a consultancy. And I think it would involve so many more people. Uh, and that's not a skill set that I currently have, which is not to say that's something that I could do. Uh, it's the, the idea of hiring more people and having people instead of robots is uh, interesting to me and feels challenging, but I don't know that that's what I want to do. And I recognize that that's a much higher upside that if the service I'm offering is like, I come to you and I'm gonna handle your problem and you don't have to worry about it. Uh, I think the model I said last time was like, it's, it's the customer and then me and then the machine instead of the customer and then the machine and then me. But I don't know that I want that. Uh, someone I was having a conversation with after last episode phrased it to me like, you know, what do you want in three years? What, what do you want the, the thing to be? What do you want the company that you, that you want to be building? I think if I built a consultancy, it would be a huge operation. I would be making so much money and I don't think that's what I want. I think what I would like is if I have a service like wave that's enabling the people who do want to do the consultancy, who do want the, the responsibility of making sure that the clips get published and uh, that they're listening to the piece of media. Uh, I, I think I'm perfectly happy sacrificing some of the upside of the, the value that this is making in exchange for, I'm really just thinking about this tool and I'm making the tool the best possible way that it could be. And then if someone comes to me and is like, hey, I love Gary Vee, I really wanna be doing his clipping for him, uh, or, you know, not Gary Vee, but the, right, right. the, the C-list celebrity version of Gary Vee, uh, Gary, Gary W, uh, that, uh, you know, I really want to get in touch with Gary W. I would love to be doing his clipping for him. You have this tool. Uh, yes, you're charging whatever, $200, $500 a month for whatever the tier is, uh, but I can turn around and charge Gary V or Gary W uh, $2,000 a month. Uh, and now I also have access to Gary V. I'm, I'm chatting with him and uh, these are podcast episodes I would be listening to anyway. And that's, I think the situation that I want more, and I'm still not fully decided on that yet. Uh, but that's, that's what I'm thinking. And so ways to do that would be like, if I just make this a SAS, if I just have this as a tool, uh, and maybe it's even like an open tool that you don't even have to pay me money. If you, if you wanted to import one of Gary W's videos into this thing and, uh, clip it out, 
uh, and find the interesting pieces. So that, that ties back into what I said earlier about that the, the business doesn't always know what resonates most with their audience. Okay, well, what if there was a link in every makers.dev episode that said, hey, if there's an interesting part of this that resonated with you, click this link, and in a minimal number of clicks, you can publish on your own social media feed and it'll get retweeted by us uh, whatever the, the segment is that you thought was interesting. And uh, now, now you're uh, taking responsibility for that. That's, that's where I've sort of come to. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. You talked about a lot of things. Um, I sure did. <laughs> I need to stop talking. No, that's cool. More frequent pauses. The, the last bit is interesting. So um, I'll talk about the other bits too, but so the last bit where, you know, so what I was envisioning is like, yeah, they have their podcast player open and they say like, this is interesting and they click a button, yeah, and it clips it. Um, then you'd be like writing a podcast player too, though, or something. I guess it'd be, I guess you'd, oh, you just talked about a link that opens it in clips.marketing. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll have to think about that a little more. Anyway, uh, I'll go back to uh, the hiring people. So yeah, so I hired someone to do consulting with, um, and it was someone I had known from school, right? And But you're exactly right that it's very different once you hire someone, um, especially if they're an employee and not a contractor. Because like now it's a person and you have to pay for that person. And, you know, this was someone from school who I trusted a lot, but it was still another person. And I had to teach them about my clients and all this stuff. Um, so, yeah, it's very, very different as soon as you hire some uh, someone. Um, and I, I had more thoughts, but I lost them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll uh, note it for the future. And I have this problem in another podcast I'm doing, too. I, I just like... <laughs> dump seven points at once into the into the conversation and oh, uh, oh you talked about the... i know what i was gonna say yeah. you talked about like not like what do you want to be in three years right um yes and i have that same problem too so like yeah you, you need to think about do what you know what do you want your day to be and so i think if i were you know gonna say what i would want my day to be through you like what, what do you want your day to be um yeah. based on what i think it's more like running a SaaS than it is like hiring a bunch of people and, and doing consultancy. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's just a decision you have to make for yourself. Yeah, that's what I'm feeling. Cool. Okay. Which is, it, it's kind of strange to be in this position of like, I can, uh, looking at the numbers and sort of projecting out what would it look like to be running a consultancy versus running a SaaS, I would make so much more money as a consultancy. And I don't think it's worth the trade-off for me. Like I would rather have the freedom uh, and have that be a more attractive thing for other people of like, yeah, you know, here's my software tool and here's the business model of exactly how you can run your own consultancy based on this thing. Uh, but that person is now not my employee. That person is like doing their own independent thing. Uh, that 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 idea is much more attractive to me. Yeah, uh, I mean, which is a totally cool option, really. Like you sort of have set up this thing like maybe the answer is you do it yourself a little bit to like get the flow of everything and then it's kind of like a franchise where you say you pay me for the software here's the playbook oh, just go to the yeah. people who you like and uh so they they pay you like a SaaS, but they you also give them a playbook about how to make money with your SaaS. oh of course it's like a franchise that's exactly yeah that's exactly what i want to do yeah i don't want to own all the mcdonald's i want to own the land that the McDonald's is on and send out all the McDonald's, a playbook of like, here's how you make the fries. I don't want to make the fries, but here's how you could make the fries. Uh, and then you just pay me money and I am incentivized to make you successful. Uh, specifically, I think the situation I'm trying to avoid is that, you know, Gary W emails me at two in the morning and is like, Hey, the clip you just made is bad, right? but it's not bad for a technical reason. Like all the technical stuff was fine. It's you, you clipped out a bad part of it or you misspelled this word. And, uh, that that's, I don't want to have that interaction. I thrive really well with like really long uninterrupted stretches of time where I can just be focused on whatever I'm doing. And that's, that's more, much more amenable to like, I'm building this piece of software than I'm working with humans. Part of my personal struggle in this, I think is that Something I'm working with with uh, the woman I'm dating right now is that I have a avoidant attachment style, and I think part of that uh, that, that that behavior lends itself to that I uh, highly value being like fiercely independent. That I uh, never rely on anyone because relying on someone is scary, uh, and that has to do with like my childhood and a whole bunch of other things. But uh, the the I, I try to put myself in positions where I am the only person I need to depend on, and uh, I. I feel bad and guilty asking people for things. And so I see this as a point of growth in my life that if I, if I was 
pushing more things to like, okay, yes, I, I have an employee and I need to depend on this employee to, to be able to get things done. Uh, that would probably stretch me as a person. Uh, but I don't know. It feels like too much too soon. Like, I think uh, it, it's something I'm cognizant of that uh, my, my natural tendency, which may not be healthy and may not be the, the direction that I want to grow in is to uh, be doing a SaaS, to be doing a, something where, you know, I, I have my things and then there's this very firm boundary and then you do your stuff over there. Uh, and if you want to leave at any point, that's totally fine. And uh, if I want to change my thing, that's that's fine too. We're, we're decoupled. Uh, and I, I would like to be playing with that boundary more, but starting a consultancy seems like way <laughs> right. too much too fast. Uh, yeah. But that's a thing I'm keeping in mind. Yeah, that's like, I really enjoyed working with, you know, my friend who I had hired, but um, if it had been some, you know, it was still super stressful and he was my friend, right? So if it yeah. had been someone who I didn't know and I hired more than one of them, I just, I, I realized that that is not the, the life I want. Um, and I think you're similar. So, yeah. Cool. This is so nice talking with you. Our, our brains are very similar. <laughs> so, I think so. Yeah. It's nice to get this affirmation of like, yes, it's fine leaving money on the table if you're living a life more the way you want to. Uh, I have two more things I'd like to talk about, but first, oh, you got a VR headset, which I'm so excited about. I Tell me did. about that. Yeah. The Oculus Quest 2. Did it blow your mind? It <laughs> yeah, it was pretty cool. Um, I got sort of nauseous the first time. I'm hoping that doesn't happen again. And then it lost tracking once. Um, I think like I have a really bright window and that made me really ill because it like stuttered <laughs> as I was turning. Oh, that was not yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I never used to, like, I, I used to love roller coasters and stuff. And so I was like, oh, it'll be fine. And then I got kind of sick of it. So hopefully that goes away. But yeah, I got it after you uh, recommended it. And then someone else uh, independently recommended it for similar reasons. And so I was like, all right, cool. I'll get one. Um, cool. It's really neat. Yeah. you it. Uh, I put on earlier, like I had a Google Cardboard at one point, which is like you put your phone in it. And I had seen yeah. other iterations. Um, like I tried a Rift before and it wasn't as immersive. This is really like uh, really immersive. Um, and of course the first thing I wanted to do with it was make a game for it. So <laughs> I started, yeah, I, uh, got unity working over the weekend and made a super simple <laughs> ball rolling around. Uh, and that was really Amazing. cool. Yeah. How cool that like, <laughs> of course that's what you did. <laughs> the, the level of engagement you can have with this sort of technology is just like different than other people can do. Uh, my mind is blown by the Oculus Quest 2. I went through a really similar experience of like, I was part of the original Kickstarter for the Oculus Rift and that had four cables coming off of it and was just terrible. And if you, it, it did, uh, I think three axis tracking, but if you, if you moved forward or lurched forward or like try to bend around the space, it was wrong in a way that you couldn't quite articulate and you just felt sick. Yep. Uh, and that's fixed and it's fixed in this beautiful self-contained $300 standalone device that has to be linked up with a Facebook account. And that's the whole thing, but that's, it's fine. I'll take that. Uh, I've gotten five of my friends and counting to get this. And it's just because, you know, you try it for the first time and it's like, wow, I'm in a different place. And this, it's so easy. You just plug it in and, oh man, it's, uh, I'm, I'm thinking a lot about co-presence experiences to be having with people, especially in these COVID times. And especially like a lot of my friends are remote, uh, and living in d different parts of the world. Uh, but you can make these experiences in VR where like, you feel like you're sitting next to a person looking at a huge virtual screen, the killer app that I want to make, uh, that I'd love your experience in making this on unity. Uh, if this is something feasible in unity, or I think I'm going to try WebXR for prototyping this is I want just like a URL that I can send someone that if they have a VR headset, they're suddenly in this immersive 3d space and if they don't it's just in their browser but we can watch a movie together that uh, is it's it's not streaming i don't want it to be streaming because then uh if it's something like zoom that i've had difficulties with if i'm streaming it to, to multiple people now it's sort of dependent on my internet connection uh i don't want it to be dependent on my internet connection i want it to be like either shared through web torrent or from a, a central space uh and then i just want it to work seamlessly of like the the audio chatting works and uh there's spatial audio if you're in vr and uh you can like run around and do fun things and like draw in the air in 3d or something uh what was your experience like with unity is that is that hard is that as bad as math development <laughs> i uh <clears throat> so i did a couple tutorials unity coming from a web world is very odd um it feels a lot more like so at least the tutorials 
feel a lot more of just like using Photoshop or something than it does like programming. Um, it's like sort of hard and hidden to add the scripts. So the way you program things is by adding scripts. Um, I've talked to a couple of people since then who like say, yeah, that's the tutorials. And then it feels more like programming later. Um, but it's, it's kind of weird. Um, it's also all in C sharp. And so mm-hmm. if you, I wasn't super happy about that cause I had done C sharp in the past, but it's been a long time. So I'd have to relearn that. Um, so yeah, if you can get what you want done with WebXR, I would try that first, especially since you want it to be a web page anyway. Um, but unity, I mean, it's sort of neat, like, uh, because it's kind of like Photoshop, you can like drag, like drag your spheres and your things onto the thing. And then all you have to do is like add Oculus has a whole bunch of the plugins and you just like give it a property that you can interact with it, a grabbable property, and then you can just pick it up. Right. And so you don't have to program all that stuff. It's, it's, it feels a lot like no code, um, until you get to the scripting part, but you just like drag the property you want and then you, then you can use it. So I think it's, that means it's really easy to do straightforward things, but then as soon as you want to do something that's not exactly straightforward, then you have to dive into C sharp and, you know, so. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that's the, the, the trap of, uh, of no code. Uh, I didn't know it was C sharp. I, I remember liking C sharp in college, I think was the last time I played with that, but it's, it's a functional language. It's like functional C. No, that's F sharp. Um, okay. yeah. C sharp is more, is Java. Basically it's Microsoft's version okay. of Java. Ah, gross. <laughs> Yeah, I'll try to get it done in WebXR. Uh, what are you thinking for this? You you made the ball roll around. Uh, is is this another project? <laughs> yeah. Is so I wanted a, to talk about this too. To um, okay. Well, so it's just for fun for now. Like I was like, I wonder if I can make a game, right? Um, or make it do anything really. Uh, but I also it got me thinking about how much just stuff I do and how many projects I work on. Um, so I counted in 2020, I released 17 different projects. Uh, Amazing. 10 of them made money. So it's like, not like they don't do anything, you know? Amazing. Um, However, so yeah, I, I go back and forth because if I just work on one thing, like part of me is like really attracted to that because it's like, you just have the one focus, right? And within that you do lots of different things, but you have your one app and you, and you build it. Um, I, I know that I always want to start more things though. So I let myself start more things and now I'm up to like 17 active projects. That is too many. <laughs> like I cannot keep track of them all and it's stressful. And I like feel my, like I feel anxiety because I'm not pushing them forward. And so like how, what's the balance there? How do I, how do I figure out what I need to work on? You know, what some things are, I know are just for fun, like Oculus. I don't expect to make, you know, a game and then sell it. Um, although I suppose I could, if I got good enough, but who knows that would take years. Right. Um, so that I know is just for fun. So I don't feel that stress on that kind of project, but for all these other things, yeah. Like how do you figure out what to work on and how much do you work on each thing? I don't know. And it's stressful. Chris, are you the voice inside my head? I think so. <laughs> I think so this is, this is the core problem of my life. Uh, I'm reminded also of, we had an episode about TikTok development. Um, of like you, you have two different projects switching yeah. between 17 different projects. That's, I know that's like, and it just tick, happened. tick, 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 development. It just happened. Uh, right. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Uh, here's uh, an uh, insight that I had about myself that I, I think might be helpful for you is I've, uh, there's a, there's a book I read called mind hacker that has a chapter in it, uh, called the one question IQ test. And the one question that uh, they ask to, uh, to try to answer this question of like, are you doing things that are making you smarter or making you dumber is when you're doing the thing or around that person or in that place. Do you feel like the world is becoming bigger and funnier and full of opportunity? Or do you feel like the world is shrinking and becoming more dangerous and becoming scarier? If the former, the thing you're doing is making you smarter. If the latter, the thing you're doing is making you dumber. Objectively being in the position where you have 17 different projects in itself is not good or bad. You have 17 options. When I find myself in a positive mental state, uh, when my stomach is not upset, when like I've gotten my son and I'm, I'm well slept and everything else, I go on a walk and I just feel like my brain's exploding of like, ah, how exciting. There's all these things I could be working on. This is great and positive and I'm bouncing around all over of between one project and another project thinking like, oh, and here's, here's a way I could solve this problem. And ooh, here's a way that I could push this other thing forward. And it just feels great and I feel in flow and it's, it's wonderful. And then on days where I wake up and I've slept poorly the night before and, uh, my tummy feels a little rumbly and, uh, I don't know, maybe maybe something else is going on in my life of, I I feel emotionally handicapped in some other, uh, way. 
that's the situation where it feels more like an obligation. Uh, you, you said it feels stressful and you feel anxiety about not pushing it forward. Uh, for me, like objectively nothing has changed. I still have the 17 different projects, but looking at that from a, a negative emotional place, that feels now overwhelming. That feels now like an obligation. It feels more negative. It feels like, oh, and I have to push this thing forward instead of right. like, I get to push this thing forward. Uh, that's, that's been an insight for myself in, in just the last few months of that. It, it, intrinsically, it is not necessarily good or bad that I have so many things going on. Uh, the, the, the layer of this to be focused on is, do I, am, am I excited? Am I feeling positively? Is, are all these options uh, fun and uh, like a menu of things that I could choose from? Or does it feel overwhelming and negative uh, and bad? And uh, I've, I've, I've started pinpointing that as like, that has to do much more with my current emotional state than it does with the, the external state of how many projects I have. Yeah, that's a really interesting point because I do kind of feel, <laughs> I felt kind of crappy for the last few days. And so, uh, yeah, maybe that's just a result of that. Um, yeah, it's also just, I think if I have two or three projects, it's exciting and 17 is too many. So maybe <laughs> I need to work on that. <laughs> 17 is a lot. <laughs> 17 yeah. is a lot of projects. Yeah. Uh, how, what, what's your process for, uh, choosing what to work on? Uh, it sounds like now might not be the, the healthiest mental state for you to be answering the question, but like, uh, I don't, uh, uh, okay, here, here's a way to phrase it. How, how would you recommend for me? I also have so many things going on. Uh, I, I'm scared to count them. It, it's probably about 17. Uh, what, what process would you recommend for me to, to decide which of those seven things to focus on or if there yeah. are some that I, I should be ignoring? So some of it is what is urgent, which is not always a great way to do things, but like, so if you have customer service requests, right? Um, I tend to prioritize those. I do not get as many as you, right? So um, so maybe that's, you know, why I can prioritize them, but I, but I generally, you know, stop and help people. Um, the, the other one, so the things I'm thinking about are, what is actually, so I need to have a living. So what is actually making me money? Um, and then what do I enjoy doing? Hopefully there's a cross section there, right? Uh, what do I think can make me money or I think I will enjoy doing in the future? And then um, where do I know that I can... So part of it is like, what do I... What, on which projects do I know the next step? And I know that will push the project forward. Um, the problem when I have so many, I found, is that I may know like six next steps and I just get overwhelmed and then do nothing. <laughs> And, uh, that is a problem that I have not figured out yet. Mm. I've, I've felt that on file inbox. There's just so many directions that I could take it. And it's been difficult for me to figure out a, a way to prioritize what better and worse is. And I think I'm better articulating that if it's because I don't really have a vision of who the person is, who I'm helping with that clips marketing is just so straightforward because my, my proximate goal is I'm trying to make it easier to publish more clips for myself. And in the process of me doing that, I feel this pain and frustration of like, oh, this step takes too long. Great. Here's the place to laser focus. It's very clear what the, what the next thing is. But with file inbox, it's like, okay, well, I'm talking to some sign printers and the sign printers would benefit from a way to verify that a Photoshop file is of the proper resolution and size. And then I'm talking to some accountants and the accountants are like, the thing that we need is extra security and uh, SharePoint integration. And if I'm not laser focused on this is the person I'm helping and I'm still not, uh, it's still a thing I'm struggling <laughs> with on file inbox. Uh, then it just sort of explodes into this complexity of like, well, have I even considered that loan officers are another demographic I need to be helping? Uh, and what are the, what are the things that, that they want for that? Um, so that's, I, I think, I think when I'm feeling that sense of overwhelm, it, it's because I haven't put my finger on like what, the ultimate thing I'm trying to get done is and, and who the person is that I'm helping. I've, I've somehow lost sight of that. Um, I like your prioritization questions, uh, trying to, trying to maximize, like making sure that you're getting done the things that you need to get done. So if there are time sensitive things that are obligations, if there's something in taxes right. uh, that you need to do, like that comes first, even though it, it's not going to be fun. Uh, and then try to maximize for activities that are, uh, both making you money that you'll enjoy doing. Uh, and then also looking forward of, uh, the, the things that you're currently doing 
might not be enjoyable or making money forever. So how can you be looking uh, to the future for like what the what the next thing might be? Um, hmm. Interesting. How so? What? Uh, what? What is your what is your current landscape of that look like? What's? I uh, I guess I think that the very next thing I'm curious about is if we were just optimizing for enjoyment. Uh, what's what's at the top of that list? What are the of those 17 projects, which ones pop to mind of that, that they're the most enjoyable to be working on? Uh, enjoyment right now would probably be something like mess with WebRTC or Unity or something like, like in, in ways oh, so that, much fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that are fun, but not, I, I still need, you know, so that that's why I don't mind doing those on the weekend because I, I don't have a way to, you know, to uh, capitalize on those right now, but they're just fun to work yeah. on. So I just do those. Yeah. Um, I do find it very enjoyable to like actually help people. That's why I like try to be available on Twitter. That's why I try to um, you know, like do the teaching things like Egghead and stuff. So Egghead is an example of something where I feel like I can be helpful and make money. So that's good. Mm. Um, it is though stressful to like like make the thing. It's a lot of work to make a course, um, yeah. but you know that I don't mind that so much. Um, and then, but see, I just keep adding things, right? And then what, what I would really love to do is if I could figure out a way to get Meeting Place to actually pay all of my bills. Um, like, that's where I'm like, maybe I just go all in on Meeting Place, right? But at the current, I, I, I can't see that happening, like, in, in the next, say, year or two, um, unless I drastically change my model there, just because the mm -hmm. price per group is so low. Um, so, like, it's something that I feel like I could make useful and make a few thousand dollars a month on, but... Uh, without it being like a venture scaled business, it, I think it's hard to reach it, as many groups as it needs to. Hmm. A, a challenge that I think we have is that personal enjoyment is a very important part of the calculus of what to be working on, especially for what's going to be profitable in the future. Um, and I've noticed uh, I, I, in myself and also uh, talking with you that I think we both go through these cycles of being energized in the work that we're doing and then uh getting bored or sort of listless or like not knowing what the next step forward is and then sort of getting stuck uh that's a that's a cycle that i've noticed in myself um and like i used to i used to trivialize and marginalize that 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 wasn't important that that was just ah i gotta i gotta be more disciplined i gotta make sure that i'm working but the way that i'm running my business is i am the most valuable valuable asset and so if if I could sort of step outside of myself and say, okay, here's this business. It runs on this monkey. And if this monkey is happy, he gets more done. So do you want to make the monkey happy or do you want to not make the monkey happy? I'd be like, yes, of course. I want to make the monkey as happy as possible. But what does the monkey need? The monkey wants to make this thing with clips and marketing. That looks like a valuable thing. Yes, go for it. Go do it. Uh, oh, the monkey wants to learn WebRTC and Unity development. Two incredibly valuable and impressive skills that like couldn't possibly not be useful in the future uh and that's the thing that, that would make the monkey most happy like yes of course <laughs> do it do it yes uh whatever you want to do um th that's that's a point of optimization in our businesses right if, if, if of maximizing enjoyment uh i i used to try to tie myself to the mast and be uh sort of authoritarian with myself of like all right i need to get at least this much work done in file inbox and because that's the thing that's most important. But I just died inside. Uh, it was not fun. Um, in your position specifically right now, uh, it sounds like you have a comfortable amount of runway uh, to, to be working on whatever you want to work on. Uh, th there's, nothing, there's nothing necessarily that you need to do approximately to, to make sure that money's coming in. Uh, and you're in this comfortable position of having this incredible, uh, valuable, marketable skill set that if at any point you decided that money was a limiting factor in your and your family's life, okay, well, we can switch gears and take on more consulting gigs. And uh, that uh, I'm, I'm not worried about you running out of money. Uh, so I think if, if I was the Chris outside of you that was managing, like, how would you like to be optimizing Chris's time? Uh, if, if WebRTC and Unity development is the thing that's most exciting to you right now, if that's if that's the, the point, if that's the direction that's you, you feel most in flow right now, like, yeah, dude, go for it. You, you've got the time and flexibility. Not many people get to do that. And I, I think it's very unlikely that investing time in those places would be a bad choice. Uh, that, that's my, that's my perspective on that. Yeah. So I, I agree. Um, so, okay. So let's, let's say I have a year of runway or so, which is more or less correct. We'll, we'll say that. Um, okay. 
of Comfortable Runway, and I don't want to do consulting again. And I know that it takes SASs, say, a year or two before they can start paying full-time salaries. Um, yeah. That means that, like, so what I'm feeling now is whatever I'm working on now is what is going to need to pay my full-time salary in a year. And so I need to yeah. work on something now that's going to do that. Um, yeah. I know that's not exactly true because I do have some residual, like I do have things making money now, even though it's not full-time income. That's why my mm. runway could be a little longer, right? If I cut back on things. Yeah. But it just, I think the stress I'm feeling is like, I have all these things that are sort of working and I think I need to push one of them forward to like mm. make my full-time income. And I need to start that like now, if in a year mm. I want that to be, you know, true. And so that I think is the stress I'm feeling at this moment. I feel that that's a scary position. Um, feeling like there's, there's pressure to, to pick the right thing right now. And that, that if you're not all in on the, the track that is going to be able to replace your full-time income, uh, it's going to take a year to get there. So if you're not fully focused on that right now, uh, you're, you're going to find yourself in a year not having the, the income to be able to replace your full-time salary yeah. and then you'll have to go back to consulting. Uh, yeah. I guess I'm just afraid of being in the same position. Like a year from now, I'll have 23 projects <laughs> and maybe 11 <laughs> of them pay some amount of money. Um, but that's yeah. not where I want to be. And so I have yeah. to optimize now for what I want in a year and I'm not hundred percent sure how to do that. That's tricky. It's a, it's a tricky problem because you're, you're sort of trying to optimize for two things at once of uh, the, the thing that's going to, uh, most guaranteed bring in the most amount of money, which I think right now is probably meeting place. Um, and also noticing that that's not necessarily work that's most energizing to you. That if, if you're setting yourself in that direction, that, uh, that's it, 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 the sense that I'm getting from you is that it, it feels difficult to be working on that, that, that the, the path forward isn't as straightforward and, uh, that that work is not as energizing. Is that yeah, accurate? I, so I think, I think it could be energizing. I think, but I think I, it needs like, it's the type of project that needs my full attention to really reach what it could. And so, um, I feel like I would have to give everything else up to really focus on that, which is probably not true. Right. I'm probably making false equivalencies. Uh, but, um, <laughs> like I, I feel like it's the kind of thing that needs at least one full-time person to really push it to, to be a thing. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Is there, is there some compromise we could come to of like, uh, we're in sort of a weird business where these random side projects can quickly turn into things that are bringing in full-time income. Uh, if, if I was talking with you as like a, as an investor, uh, and I'm trying to maximize the place where you're spending your energy. That's going to maximize the, uh, my, my ROI, uh, in a year. Um, I think I might suggest something like, you know, can, can we, can we allocate time in a way that, uh, you're happy with and energized by that's, uh, still pushing forward meeting place, the, the, strongest bet that we have right now of, uh, being able to have that financial freedom in, in a year, uh, and maybe spend X percent of your time on anything you want to. So, uh, the, the, like the Google 20% time, but for you, I think I would even bump it higher. I would do like 50, 50, uh, but yeah, I think that's up to you. So when we talked about TikTok development, like that's actually what it is. It's like spend six weeks yeah. solely on this thing. And then, and you know, in six weeks is a good chunk of time. You get stuff done and then switch six weeks on something entirely else. And kind of yeah. what I do is more shotgun. It's like, I'll spend a day on this and then an afternoon on this and like <laughs> an evening on this, um, yeah. which is not optimal, but I have trouble forcing <laughs> myself to like ignore everything for six weeks and just do the, you know, one other thing. Um, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> is there some, is there some unit of work or some habit that you could be doing of like the first thing you do in the morning is push forward meeting place and you spend some amount of time on that, that like whatever amount doesn't feel tyrannical that you're, you're not dreading it and you have some reward at the end of that. Uh, and then you have the rest of the day to, to work on web RTC and, and unity and actual fun stuff. Uh, yeah. I, just, just minimizing the friction of like, this is going to get done every day and you're at least pushing forward that you're, you're getting started on it. Yeah. I've done that 
similar things before. Um, so some of my most productive time probably has been, well, certain not during the pandemic when I've been able to get out and like see people and like be happy that way. And then in the morning I'll do, I used to do morning pages. Uh, that's from the artist way. We've talked about that before. Um, I would all, I also for a while did the, um, there's like, it's kind of like a meditation visual visualization exercise. Um, there's all sorts of apps that, but it's like, it's just like 10 minutes in the morning and it really makes you calm and, and makes you feel really good. Um, mm -hmm. and so I recommend that it's kind of like a workout, but you sit there and so it's, it's nice and just listen to the thing. Um, and then that really set me up for the morning. Um, that was before I had kids. <laughs> and so <laughs> since then I'll try to do something like that and it works for like three days. And then, yeah. uh, I have to get, so I'm, I'm the one in the morning who like gets my, uh, kid ready and set up for virtual school that yeah. kills my morning <laughs> basically. Um, yeah. and so any, like, unless I get up at, you know, five in the morning, which I do sometimes, but like, it just, I, I cannot be productive while I'm getting him set up and making sure he's doing the right work. Um, yeah. so yeah, that I don't know what to do about either. <laughs> that does sound incredibly hard. That's a, that's a point that I am at the same time, uh, envious of you four of like what how amazing that you have children you've you've made a new human chris that's amazing uh and uh at the same time thankful of like i sabotage myself j just like in, in this solipsistic way of uh going off in, in different directions and i i feel like that sort of flow for me is very sensitive if there was a little chaos monkey in my space uh that also had their own needs and, and was trying to get stuff done that i was responsible for helping uh, and also they were trying to kill themselves all the time. Right. <laughs> I go to jail if they succeed. Like, oh my gosh, that, that, <laughs> I, I am so impressed that you're able to get the amount of stuff done that you get done because my conception of me with children is just like, I can't do anything else. Yeah. Uh, I, I've, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I mean, looking forward to, and also feeling a little anxious, uh, about the, the prospect of, of having kids. Yeah. That, that is a challenge. I mean, I, so I have a very supportive wife who wants to be a stay at home mom. And so that's what she does. So after she wakes Amazing. up, she takes the kids and I get to work all day. And that's basically how that works. Um, <laughs> cool. Yeah. Also, like, I feel like a lot of this episode has been me, like not feeling very good. Uh, I, I generally feel great. Like I'm very, very privileged and happy to be in the position I'm in. It's just yes. working through some of these things is still, is still a struggle and a challenge. So I feel that. Yeah. Yeah. I've, yeah, like, you know, this tying back to what we said earlier in the episode, uh, or what I said about, I feel like the world is just colored more negatively when I'm uh, sick. In the specific way of if it's a stomach thing. I, I don't know if that's something physiological, but... There, there the, is, the actually. Is just, so you yeah. have as many neurons in your gut as you do in your brain. And so, what? Yeah, yeah. And so when you feel bad, gastro, like, troubles, yeah. uh, it just, it messes everything up. Um, yeah. Oh. It's like a second brain. Yeah. <laughs> who's, who's really in charge here? <laughs> it's, it's, is my brain just the outsourced brain for my stomach to, to find food? <laughs> yeah. They're, diff they're different neurons, but th this is still, yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. No, yeah. So from, from an outside uh, perspective, for what it's worth, uh, and you're making great progress. You have a lot of fantastic options. Uh, you're getting a lot done on multiple fronts. Uh, I... I am not worried about the progress that you're making or, or your ability to be able to replace your full-time income uh, in about a year. Um, I think you're doing a great job. And I think uh, what I notice for myself when, I, when I'm when i in that sort of funk is like, okay, the new problem has become, you know, we're, we're not focused on this long-term thing anymore of this spooky thing that's going to happen out in a year. Uh, the proximate problem here is like, I feel bad. <laughs> and what are the things that I can do to enable me to feel better? Uh, it doesn't matter if that's not fully aligned with this long-term goal. Uh, is it playing video games? Great. I'm going to play video games and do that guilt-free because aligned with this longer-term perspective of uh, I am the, the sole asset of my business that I'm, I'm trying to maximize uh, my, my ability to do meaningful work. Uh, enabling myself to feel better in the moment is uh, a... a very effective way to get myself to be doing more things. And the, the faster I'm able to do that, the faster I'll get to a position where I can be making these long-term uh, yeah. 
decisions much more clearly and, and positively. Yeah, you got to make the monkey happy, right? <laughs> Got to make the monkey happy. There's our episode <laughs> title. <laughs> you got to gotta make the monkey happy. That's right. Yeah. All right. That was a lot about me. How about you? You said you had a couple of other things. Two more things. Uh, first is really quick. I sent you Camhead, yep. and I just sent it to you as the source file because I could not figure out for the life of me how to uh, send you the, the compiled binary. Uh, I This app is done for me. It does all the things I wanted it to do. And so... I just have zero interest in it anymore. Uh, <laughs> rapid fire question. Should I publish this on the app store or should I open source it on GitHub or both? Um, if you open source it, now you have an open source project, which is sort of like a Tamagotchi Gross. that you have to feed. <laughs> um, so I don't know about that. Um, okay. I used it. Uh, it's great. Uh, I can see the first the next three things that people would want it to do because it's what i yeah. want to do um and so you may have to do a little more work before it is app store publishable okay. um but if you do that like so, so like i said if you do that like people will just send you money which is through the app store which is pretty nice um also cool. like it feels so when i published my first app it just felt so amazing like i made uh, let's say 100 bucks a month for eight years without touching the app again. amazing um holy cow it just feels so good <laughs> to, to make something like that. Um, so That's 10 grand. <laughs> That's yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It, you know, it took me and now, it, so it took me what a month or two to write the thing the first time. And then over eight yeah. years, I basically got my month or two worth of salary for it. Um, uh, so I don't know. I, if you haven't had that experience before, then I would recommend doing that because it just feels really cool when you get money for something that you made and pushed to an app store. So cool. Yeah. That's what I would say. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, I've sort of had that experience with this Chrome extension that I made called Export History that uh, has just been in the background slowly churning away of like, yeah, it's, it's made about $100 a month for, oh gosh, maybe the last four years. Uh, and sometimes people email me and they're like, I have a feature request. And I just say, no. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's been fine. Uh, okay. I'm curious what the three things are then that you think are the, the obvious things. Uh, um, so I wanted to be able to, and maybe, maybe you could do this, and maybe I just didn't look hard enough. I wanted to be able to move my bubble to the other side of the screen. Uh, yeah, you sure cannot do that. Um, I wanted to be able to make the bubble smaller because it was kind of big on my yeah. screen. And I should have probably wrote, wrote them, written them down. <laughs> um, I'll, I will use it again, and I will let you know what my next cool. thing was. Yeah. Oh, I wanted to be able to disable like the clicking and swiping stuff. Like if I knew I didn't want my face to be big ever. Um, yeah. that I wanted to disable that. So I didn't accidentally do that. So those are the three cool. things. I like that. I was thinking about also doing a system wide keyboard shortcut to switch between the two angles. How do you feel about that? Uh, yeah, you can do that. Um, okay. the one thing I noticed about the video, one of the videos you made with it, um, that you recently posted, uh, I could see your mouse cursor on your face. And so if yes. you either hid the mouse cursor or made a keyboard shortcut, then that would get rid of that problem. Oh, Chris. That is so, oh, it's so frustrating because I did it. I did the code that you're, it's supposed to hide the mouse and it's not, and it has to do with that the app has to be key and visible, but it is. Mm -hmm. So I have the code that like makes it key and visible and then I hide the mouse and then that should hide the mouse and sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, oh, it's, I hate it. That's not bad. I don't know why. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I've gotten around it just by like, well, I haven't obviously because I published the video with, with it on, but the, the way that I think I'm going to do to get rid of it is just to put my mouse like at the bottom of the screen. I was going to say, can you just slide it yeah. all the way over? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but also maybe with a keyboard shortcut, if I just have the exact same code, maybe that'll work on the keyboard shortcut where, where it's not working there. Uh, neat. Okay, one other question. Uh, that's more of a technical question on clips marketing. I'm not even quite sure what the question is. I think, I think what I want to do is just sort of talk out loud of the, the architecture of this, uh, and just interrupt me when you feel like I'm making a mistake. Uh, right now, this is a Firebase app. I love Firebase. It's, I don't have to think about the database layer anymore. It's, it's fantastic. Uh, I have a user model in Firebase and the user has many videos. And I think what I, I, I think I want to move that architecture to be uh, a brand has many videos and then a user authenticates with a brand. 
because there's going to be some brand specific things of like a theme and I'm probably going to want multiple uh, social media accounts associated with different brands. So I think the first thing I'm going to do is swap that around. And then it's kind of tricky right now. I'm, I'm importing YouTube videos and there's a way that I can get a, the raw video file from the YouTube video by using YouTube DL. But I don't know that I want to depend on that long term. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think the thing that I want is two different ways to import the video. Uh, either you can upload the video directly, which I recommend, or for now, and this is temporary and it might break, you can just enter the, the YouTube URL uh, and then that imports the video the same way. So now I've gotten to a point where I have a brand that has a video and I have the raw video file for that video. And then everything after that, uh, well, the, the clipping and the bookmarking is pretty dialed in. There's tweaks I want to make to that, but like that's functional. And then I have the problem of I need to take that longer video file and extract a clip from it. And there's an API called uh, QEncode where I can just send it the URL of a video and the timestamps and authenticate it with a bucket to send me the shorter clip. Cool. And uh, so I think I do that. And now I have the clip stored in Firebase Cloud Storage. Uh, and then I need to transcribe it and I can do that through Google. And then that's going to happen through Firebase. And I'm going to need to think about like what my interface is for transcribing. Uh, but I, I think I know what I'm going to do there because the Google transcript is like 98% accurate. And then I am going to need to run a custom FFmpeg command. And as far as I can tell, there's no way to do that on a cloud service. Like there's no cloud service that's run any arbitrary FFmpeg commands. Uh, Q encode is just like encoding and decoding video and then uh, clipping and, and merging clips. So I think I'm going to try to run FFmpeg in a uh, Google Cloud function as a serverless thing. And I'm a little concerned about that, that if the job takes too long, it might get killed. I think there's like a maximum timeout limit for uh, Firebase, but if it's clips, it should be okay. And then I'm at the point where entirely on the website, I can go from a video, either a raw video file or a YouTube video, all the way through to uh, I have this custom clip that's transcribed. Uh, how does that sound from an architecture standpoint? Where am I making a mistake? Uh, no, that sounds pretty good. Um, I, if you let people clip arbitrary length things, then I would say, what happens if someone tries to clip, you know, 60 minutes of a video? Um, yeah, so, that would break. So, yeah. So like, be careful about that. Um, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that sounds, that sounds pretty good. You could like... The, f the thing I thought you were going to say is you're going to run FFmpeg on, you know, like a DigitalOcean server or something and have some kind of transfer back and forth, um, which would add another layer, but then you wouldn't have the Google cloud functions. So if you were worried about, you know, that, then I uh, see that being relatively straightforward for you to make your own little API to like send it a file and get the FFmpeg thing back. Um, but yeah, I mean, in general, that sounds like a good architecture. I like FFmpeg on DigitalOcean. That's a really good idea because then I'm not... I have more control of the environment. I think there's something so romantic about just having everything serverless. Of <laughs> like, okay, now this can scale to a hundred million people all using it, and I don't need to do anything else. Um, that's that's been the part from an architecture standpoint on File Inbox that I've uh, had the most discontentment with. Of like, <laughs> there are physical servers somewhere. There are virtualized servers yeah. that uh, I'm sure are horribly outdated just because I haven't logged into them and like done the the apt get uh what is it apt get upgrade uh distribution or something yeah. to upgrade the operating system and then there's like vulnerabilities that happen like the ssl thing that oh they had catchy names i forgot all of them there, there have been like two of them in the last three years that i was just really late on updating and if it's serverless i don't have to worry about any of that it just happens and i don't have to spin up a new server uh so i i think it definitely would be easier in the short term to uh, spin up a digital ocean server and would leave me with less restrictions on like the video length and the things I was able to do. I mean, you could also, but if I can put a, go ahead. I was going to say like, if you're worried about all that stuff, which is why I use Heroku. So you could use Heroku also, um, and just do a background job thing, uh, use sidekick. It would queue for you. And then, you know, just have a thing that tells you if your queue is more than 10 jobs deep or something. And, uh, hmm. um, yeah, so you could just, you can make a Heroku thing uh, that would work also. This may not be rational. I hate Heroku. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to put DB inbox on Heroku many moons ago and 
before that I was paying something like $50 a month in server fees for like two different servers. And uh, it was reasonably fast, fast, but I was I was running into these issues of uh, uh, upgrading servers and things. And I was like, okay, we're, we're just gonna move to Heroku. It's gonna be a little bit more expensive, but like, it's fine. For the same number of dinos as I currently had virtual servers, it was gonna cost something like $300 a month. Mm. And my page loads were taking like 10 times longer. And I contacted support and I was like, hey, uh, why is this so slow? And they were like, oh, it's slow because you're using slim templates. And so don't use slim templates, use ERB templates. And I was like, I'm gonna have to rewrite all of my views if I do that. And I don't wanna do that. So you're telling me you're gonna charge me way more and it's gonna be slower? <laughs> uh, no, I don't wanna do that. Uh, for the, the benefit of like scaling. So that's that like inspired this whole transition to trying to do truly serverless things. So it, it's a good suggestion. That's fair. <laughs> it would probably be reasonable to do. And I just, I don't like Heroku. I've been burned by them in the past. I'm a scorned, scorned lover. Uh, cool. Okay. Yeah. That sounds like the development I'm going to do this next week then. I would love to get to the point where I could do this clipping. And then, oh, a whole other thing I want to talk about is queuing these things up. I'm, I'm not sure if I want to uh, build that into clips.marketing or make that its own service, like, I don't know, queue.marketing to, to be queuing up the clips and then they're just talking to each other. But I'll save that for another episode. I haven't, I haven't thought about that as much. Uh, nice. I've talked about all the things I want to talk about. Me too. Then I'll see you next week. Goodbye. All right.